Welcome to Classic Comedy of Old Time Radio. I'm your host, Ron Eckelbarger. The Bickersons bicker in luxury today. Today's show will be a bit different in that we do not have the entire half-hour-old gold show for you. Uh, we've had a few of these in the past. What we do have are the Bickerson segments from three different shows. The segments are titled The Presidential Suite, there's your luxury, Income Tax Refund, and The New Apartment. These shows aired, as far as I can tell, on May 28th, June 11th, and June 18th, all in 1948. Here now are The Bickersons, starring Don Amici and Francis Langford. 400 miles from home, in the presidential suite of a San Francisco hotel, the Bickersons have retired. Yes, the presidential suite. How did it happen? Well, having arrived at the hotel at 2 o'clock in the morning, the weary John Bickerson dragged himself towards the reservation desk. As the wide awake black... John, pull yourself together. Fix your coat. Straighten your tie. Your hair's all mucked up. Pull your tie. Mucked your coat. Straighten your hair. Why don't you leave me alone, Frank? Keep quiet. The clerk is staring at you. What do I care? Ooh, hush up. Good evening. Good evening. Where's the register? On a room for myself and my bath with a connecting wife. <laughs> I beg your pardon? He means a room and bath. This is my husband. How do you do? Glad to know you. Make it fast, will you please? I can't keep my eyes open. Well, what did you say the name was? Dickerson. We're from Los Angeles. I'm Mrs. Dickerson. How do you do? How do you do? Move it along, will you, buddy? Do you have a reservation, Mr. Dickerson? No, we're only staying overnight. My husband's here on business. He's a salesman for the Maytag washing machine company. He just got the job. I see. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Maytag. Bickerson. My name is John Bickerson. Oh, how do you do? What's all this? How do you do? Listen, mister, it's two o'clock in the morning. I've been traveling half the night and I've got to get to bed. I appreciate that, Mr. Dickerson, but the unfortunate truth of the matter is that we're entirely filled up. Filled up? What do you mean you're filled up? You mean there isn't one room in this great big hotel? I'm afraid not. There's a convention here this week. The glass blowers convention. There can't be that many glass blowers. You'd be surprised, madam. Every single room in this hotel is occupied by a glass floor. Well, get one to blow. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. If you'd only wire, Frank, I'd beg you to send a wire. Well, I forgot. Anyhow, how did I know it was going to be a glass floor convention? Oh, I'm dead. You've got to help us, mister. I don't know what I could do. Of course, I dare say one of you could share a room with the chambermaid. Will that be all right with you, John? Well, sure, but where are you sleep? <laughs> The only other solution I have, uh, no, I don't think we can afford it. Well, what is it? Well, the presidential suite is vacant. Presidential suite? Yes, but you can only have it till six o'clock in the morning. Is the president coming? The suite will be occupied, madam. I knew he played the piano, but I didn't think it was a glass blower. <laughs> And why do I care? A time like this, money means nothing to me. I'll pay anything. It's uh, two hundred dollars. Please send somebody for our bag. Certainly. Will you carry your husband, or shall I? <laughs> Just lift his head out of my ink pot so he doesn't smudge the register. Oh. In the presidential suite, the Bickersons have retired. Mrs. Bickerson tosses fretfully in the elaborate bedroom as poor husband John, his mind turning at the thought of the enormous expenditure, struggles through another miserable night. Listen. Go on. No! Oh, no, it's not. It's not. It's not. Oh, my God. 
What's the matter? What's the matter? Where is she? I just can't stand another second of it. That whining and snarling and giggling and clanging. It's driving me out of my mind. It makes you black. Who's doing it? You're doing it. You started snoring the minute you fainted in the lobby. You snored when they carried you into the elevator. You snored when I wanted to you. And you've been snoring in the president's bed. Oh. No wonder I have wrinkles and crow's feet. I grow old while you lie there and cluck. What do you think I am, John? Oh, cluck. <laughs> Don't be so funny, Mr. Biggerson. Not funny. I'm sleepy, Blanche. Put out the light. I'm so sorry you dragged me along on this trip. I could die. I dragged you. Now, how do you like that? You carried on like a lunatic and forced me to take you. I begged you to stay home. Sure you did. And I know why, too. Why? Because you thought I'd think if you asked me to go, you wanted me to stay. So you asked me to stay, thinking I'd know what you were thinking. So I thought twice and fooled you. <laughs> do you think? <laughs> Put out the light, Blanche. I wish I'd stayed home. I'd better not answer that. <laughs> John, I'm worried about the house. Oh. I think I left the electric heater on in the bathroom. It might burn up the place. Won't burn. Did you turn it off? No. But how do you know it won't start a fire? I left the water running in the bathtub. John, <laughs> What does he want to get out for? John, don't you know it's impossible to shut up certain creatures for the night? You can say that again. <laughs> I'm worried about Nature Boy. Who's Nature Boy? Our cat. I thought his name was Tom. What's that Nature Boy? Well, he always listens to that song on the radio, so I thought I'd change his name. What's wrong with it? Nothing. Well, bet he's wondering what's become of us. Nobody to pet the poor thing. Maybe you ought to call him, John. Okay, what'll I call him? <laughs> no, I can call him on the telephone. You gone stuck, staring mad, Frank? How can I call a cat on the telephone? Well, he'll know it's not from the ringing of the phone. We'll comfort him. Go on, call him. It won't cost anything. The phone's right by your bed. Nobody would believe me. <laughs> Calling a cat long distance at 3 o'clock in the morning. Arthur, Get me Los Angeles, 10 said 4797, and call me back. Yes, sir. How much can a man stand to this sort of stuff before he cracks up? Oh, don't be so tragic. A lot of people call their pets up. Any sound in the house to break the monotony makes them feel better. Oh, sure. Hello. No answer. Shall I keep ringing? Just a minute. How many times have you wanted to ring, Blanche? Are you sure you've got the right number? Operator, are you sure it's the right number? I'll try it again. Oh. Hello, nature boy. Uh. Are you all right? All right. Good. I left a big dish of catnip under the sink. Don't touch the canary. Okay. Goodbye. You're satisfied. The cat feels fine. Who answered that phone? I thought you were kidding. Did somebody answer? Must have been the wrong number. You think so, John? Of course I think so. Now don't start making me believe that a cat can talk. Now, Frank, I've got to close my eyes for a few minutes. Well, as long as you're up, John, why don't you take a look at the suite? The rest of it's just beautiful. I'll look in the morning. You won't have time. The president gets in at six, and you'll probably never have another chance to see all the rules. Lock the doors and don't let him in. Lock the doors? What's the matter with you, John? How can you keep our president Truman? I'll vote for Stanton. <laughs> Okay, I won't vote at all. Yes, you will. Maybe it wouldn't do you any harm to meet the president when he gets here. Oh. You've got a nice personality when you try to be pleasant, and he might give you a job in his cabinet. Oh, for heaven's sake. As long as he's going to give you such an opportunity, I think you should vote for him, John. Okay, I'll vote for him in November. You say it, but you won't do it. Do it now. What? Go on, get up and vote for President Truman. <laughs> in the morning, and besides, the election's not until November. Well, you can tell him you're going to vote for him, can't you? I'm not telling anybody anything. I've got plenty of thinking to do before I cast my vote, and I won't have you dictating my politics. This is a free country. And why are they charging us $200 for this week? Because that's what they charge and the president can afford it. I wish we could live like the president. We are living like the president. <laughs> I mean, all the time. 
You should see this apartment. I'll bet it's got 18 rooms and 25 closets. That's fine. I dread the thought of going back to that rat nest we live in. Why can't we have a nicer place, John? There's nothing wrong with our rat nest. <laughs> Don't get out of here and start complaining. All those promises you made when you were courting me makes me laugh to think of what you said when you proposed. It doesn't make me laugh. <laughs> Of luxury, 20 servants and a mansion. Did I ever doubt you? No. Did I investigate your bank account? No. Did I hire a detective to find out about your salary? No. Yes, I did. <laughs> what? Yes, I did. Well, what did you do that for? Because I didn't know what you were getting when you married me. Neither did I. <laughs> well, that's sad about you. I don't see that you were any kind of a bargain. What have I got to show for my marriage? Have I got a home, a servant, jewels? You've got just as much as any of your crummy friends and maybe more. I haven't got one imported dress. Every rag I own is domestic. Well, turn them inside out and say they came from the other side. Believe me, the minute I get back home, I'm going out and buy a whole new wardrobe. That's all you ever do. Buy, buy, buy. You've got a million dresses. You spend every dime I make on clothes. Wonder what clothes you wear when you get to heaven. Well, why do you care? You won't be there to pay for them. <laughs> Right? We'd never have any financial difficulties if you'd only use your head a little. Why do you say that? Because we can never hold on to a penny. Why is it that I earn as much as the next guy, but the minute I trust you to run the budget, we're broke? I can't say. That's the answer. Good night, Blanche. Good night, John. Now, here are Donna Michi and Francis Langford as John and Blanche Dickerson. In the honeymoon is over. The Bickersons have retired. Poor husband John, a chronic insomniac and suffering from grunter's disease, struggles during an acute attack of his ailment. While Blanche Bickerson attempts to describe his symptoms over the phone to Dr. Hersey. Listen. This is worse than ever, Dr. Hersey. Can't you come over? Mrs. Dickerson, it's almost three o'clock. I'm sure his condition isn't critical. I'll come over in the morning. But he might recover by morning. I wouldn't want that to happen. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. I'll carry the phone into the bedroom and you can hear what John's going through. Oh, I never heard of such a thing. Gotta go and take up 
my mouth just when I'm raising a mustache. Pull out every hair. That's too bad. You caused me enough suffering. I'd rather lose your mustache than lose my sleep. What's the matter with you, Blanche? What's the matter? I just can't stand it anymore, John. Night after night, I walk the floor and get into a state because you snarl and growl and snore and whine like a bulldozer. Uh. Is it any wonder I'm so irritable and ill-tempered? Dr. Hersey won't encourage me or try to improve my nature and buoy me up. Who will help me? Nature boy. <laughs> Very funny. Oh, you're so funny, John Dickerson. I'm not funny. I'm what about me? I haven't slept for so long, I'm a nervous wreck. I bury my head under the pillows to shut up your snoring. And when I get up every morning, I have a cramp in my collarbone. I'll rub it with chicken fat. <laughs> rub it with chicken fat. You and your stupid remedy. Too much you care what I go through. Blanche, put out the light. I will not. How would you like to go through life with a constant pain in the neck? Well, I took you for better or worse. <laughs> the worst is yet to come. <laughs> That's right. Pile it on. Tell people I forced you into this marriage. Did I ever run after you? Blanche, I want to sleep. I did everything I could to discourage you, and you know it. Did I accept you the first time you proposed? No. Why not? Because you weren't there. <laughs> you wouldn't have the nerve to propose to anybody else. You sure took advantage of my innocence and youth. Oh, don't give me that you stuff. You were no chicken. I must have been, or I never would have picked up a worm like you. <laughs> Go to sleep. It's a different story now, isn't it? Never a kind word. Never a sign of affection. Never a good night kiss. And to think you used to kiss me every time I turned around. I never kissed you when you turned around. <laughs> I've been a trusting fool all these years. I should have known you don't love me, and you never did. I did, too. I mean, I do, too. <laughs> you don't. You don't. You don't. Oh, Blanche, I love you. You're lying. Swear you love me. I hope I drown in a pool of bourbon if I'm lying. <laughs> There's the answer to all our problems. You think more of a bottle of bourbon than you do of me. Uh, it's true, isn't it, John? What's true? You're in love with a bottle of bourbon. Oh, for heaven's sake. Go on, say it. I can stand the truth. Just give it to me straight. It's better with soda. <laughs> Now, just a minute, Blanche. I resent that. I don't care. You're going to accuse me of being selfish or inconsiderate or anything else. But drinking is not one of my failures. No, it's one of your few successes. <laughs> That's not true. I don't drink more than any six men you know. What? Now, you crap me into that. Only reason I use bourbon is because the doctor prescribed it. He said I would stop snoring if I took a jigger of bourbon and two aspirin every night. That's not what you do, though. Yes, it is. It is not. You're six months behind on the aspirin and two years ahead on the bourbon. <laughs> well, aspirin gives me a headache. <laughs> what else? You'd better listen to me, John. We'd get along beautifully if you'd take a meat once in a while. If there's an extra dollar in the house, it goes for your pleasure. Only two weeks ago, you had your life insured for $10,000. What about it? You're always thinking of yourself. <laughs> So, what kind of idiotic talk is that, Blanche? If I die, you get the 10000 You know perfectly well you have no intention of dying. <laughs> you only got your life insured to candlelight me. I'll drop dead in the morning. You say it, but you won't do it. <laughs> Blanche, what's the matter with you? You realize what you're saying? I'm sorry. I didn't mean it that way. I'm sorry. That's okay. Just calm down. Try to get some sleep. I can't sleep. I'm too upset. You can't stand the sight of me, can you, John? I can stand it fine. I'd like to hear you talk that way to Gloria Goose. Mm, now don't start with Gloria Goose. <laughs> Anybody could look pretty with the money she spends on clothes. Oh. Every time her husband wants a kiss, he has to buy her a dress. Believe me, you're lucky you've got a cheap wife like me. Oh. <laughs> if you were married to Gloria Goosey, you'd have to pay her for kisses. I'm not married to her, and I get them for nothing. <laughs> I mean, I hate Gloria Goosey, and I'm warning you, Blanche, if I ever hear you mention her name again, I'll... That's I... right, hit me. You've done everything else. Uh, Blanche, will you please put out the light? I have to get up so early in the morning. Good night. Are you angry, John? No, I'm just sick. You hate me? 
You know I do. What? I mean, I don't hate you. Banks, what's the matter with you tonight? What have you done? I've been so upset I forgot to give you something that came for you yesterday. A letter? Special delivery and registered. It was addressed to you and marked strictly personal and private. Oh. What did it say? <laughs> you needn't be so snide about it, John. I wouldn't have read it, but I accidentally steamed it open while I was pouring myself a cup of tea. <laughs> in the morning. Go to sleep. I want to read it right now. Put the lights on and give it to me. Oh, all right. Here it is. Oh, from the government. Good night, John. Mr. John Dickerson, sir, in checking your return for 1946, we find you have overpaid your tax and closed fine check for $76.50 to cut... Well, say, what a break. I finally... Blanche. Uh. Where's the check? Uh. Don't act sleepy now. What did you do with my $76? I bought a beautiful Evan tan bag. It's shark skin, trimmed with snake skin, and it matches my calf skin shoes. $76 for a shark skin snake? Take it back. Take it back. You hear me? Oh, stop screaming. How could you squander my hard-earned money like this? I deny myself everything. I've been cutting the straps off your old garter belts and wearing them for both times. <laughs> I had my feet half sold in a blacksmith just to save on shoes. <laughs> I don't even break my bourbon anymore. I just lick the label and stick my nose in a lifetime. I don't spend a nickel on myself. You bought a new watch chain yesterday. What watch chain? The zipper came off my pants. <laughs> you get that money back, you hear me? How can you do that, Tom? You didn't buy me anything for our anniversary. Can I keep it clean? No. Please? Ugh. Can I keep the bag, John? Oh, I slave and sweat to keep body and soul together. Deprive myself of every tiny luxury to try and make both ends meet. It isn't worth it. One fell swoop she squanders two years' savings. <laughs> what has a man got to live for? Wish I had the courage to. Maybe I will. Life means nothing anymore. It's one thing to do. John. Now, here are Don Amici and Francis Langford as John and Blanche Bickerson in The Honeymoon is Over. Mrs. Bickerson has finally realized her fondest dream, a new and larger home. It's just past midnight, and the moving man is carting the last of the Bickerson belongings into the spacious three-room apartment as the watchful Blanche supervises the unloading. Listen. No, wait! Put that in the bedroom. The bureau goes into the other room to the left. Yes, ma'am. I never realized we had so much stuff. I just can't bear to throw anything away. No, ma'am. I guess all married people are like that. Are you married? No, ma'am. I walk this way from carrying heavy furniture. <laughs> Have you got all the large pieces in? Yes, ma'am. Where do you want this mummy? Mummy? That's my husband. <laughs> Put it down. John? John? No. What's the matter, Blanche? I swear, I never saw a man like you. You can't be that sleepy. Oh, I'm very sleepy. I got one more barrel to bring in. Well, bring it. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You might at least offer to help that poor little moving man. I did help you him. You did not. I did, too. How can you say that? He even carried you up four flights of stairs. Well, I was carrying two suitcases at the time. <laughs> no, no, John Bickerson. No, there's work no. to be done. You go in the kitchen and unpack that barrel of dishes. Listen, Blanche, can't we do that in the morning? No. You promised we'd get everything straightened out, okay, and I'm okay, not going okay. to... Okay, okay, Looks like a horse all day now. Shall I set it down here, ma'am? Oh, yes, please. Over in that corner. Uh, That's everything, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Two beds, two bureaus, three barrels, 11 suitcases, two trunks, four cartons, one crate, one table, and four chairs, radio stove and refrigerator, nine cases of bourbon, and one ice bag. That checks with my list. How much do I owe you? $19.75. Oh, dear. All I've got is a $20 bill. Have you got change? No, ma'am, but I'll carry the stove down and bring it up again if you want me to work out the extra quarter. 
Oh, never mind. Here, you can keep the whole thing. Thanks. Who fits for breaking my back? I should have been a bookman. What a mess. Where in the world do I begin? I wonder if John can nail the pictures on the wall without disturbing the other tenants. John? John? Where is that man? <laughs> in a barrel. <laughs> John, John, get out of that barrel. No. Get out, get out, get out. Get out, Blanche. What's the matter? Why don't you let me sleep? What do you want? What do you want, Blanche? Get out of that barrel. I bet you broke all my dishes. Only one. Here. What did you do that for? You broke the handle off my chafing dish. Well, it was chafing me. <laughs> Don't you curl up in there again. Come on, you wake up and start unpacking these things. No. I don't know why I have to... John, more dishes? No, less. <laughs> What's the matter with you? How can you be so clumsy? I couldn't help it. They stuck to my overcoat. You can't help anything. John... The cat. What about him? Where is he? He's lost, and it's all your fault. I begged you to take care of him and see that he got here safe. He'll get here. They'll deliver him in the morning. How do you know? I put him in a sack and dropped him in the mailbox. <laughs> John, you did. Oh, stop blowing your cork. I didn't put him in any mailbox. Well, don't scare me like that. You'd better go out and look for him, John. Blanche, I guarantee you that cat will be here in the morning. What makes you so sure? Because I tied a label around his neck with a new address on it. Well, what good is that? He can't read. I know he can't read, but people can read, and somebody's bound to pick him up and deliver him. Heaven forbid. You hate that cat, don't you? I don't hate him at all. You do, too? I do not. I love the cat. I love the canary, and I love you. I don't know which one of you I love the most. <laughs> ever caught fire, which would you say first, the cat, the canary, or me? Me. <laughs> now, look, Blanche, let's just throw the mattresses down on the floor and get some sleep. Huh? I don't see how you can sleep anyway. Haven't you got any romance in your soul? Blanche, it's almost two o'clock in the morning. I don't care. For the first time since we got married, we have a real home, and you didn't even carry me across the threshold. Carry you across a threshold? That's for newlyweds. Well, what of it? We've only been married eight years. Well, I can't carry a grudge that long. <laughs> You've changed, John. I remember when you pleaded to carry me across the threshold. Oh, forget it. I won't forget it. Why don't you carry me, John? I'm too tired. Only a husband could talk like that. You're certainly not as gallant as when you were a boy. Well, you're not as boyant as when you were a gal. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, John, I won't let you sleep one wink until you pick me up and carry me across the threshold. Nobody will believe this. Come on. Can't even get my arms around you. Put down that barrel. I'm over here. <laughs> well, let's go. You needn't be so rough. Just carry me over the door and... John, you're carrying me to the window. Well, how can I see with the lights off? Oh, put me down. Oh! I'm sorry, I thought the mattress was under you. <laughs> All right. What do you care? You wouldn't care if I broke every bone in my body. You hate me. Oh, I don't hate you, Blanche. You do, you do, you do. Why don't you say you're sorry you married me? Because I'm not. Blanche, why don't you stop tormenting me? Am I the only wife in the world for you? You're the only wife in the world for me. You're lying. <laughs> Where? I swear I'm lying. What? <laughs> I never expected the first night in our new apartment would be like this. I've been looking forward to this day for years. Well, if you'll just calm down and let me get some rest, I'll be able to appreciate it. Don't you like the place, John? Oh, I love it. I know we can be happy here. There's lots of room, and, and it has such a wonderful kitchen. Still don't know how you managed to get this apartment for a measly $30 a month. We're paying 50 for that goat's nest we lived in. How did you do it, Blanche? Oh, I just used my head. I'm not as stupid as you think I am, you know. Oh, I'm sure you're not. <laughs> Is that the alarm clock? Yes, I set it. For 6.30? 4.30. 4.30? Who gets up at 
You do. You have to bank the furnace. What are you talking about? This is an apartment house. The janitor banks the furnace. You're the janitor. <laughs> what? Well, how do you think I got the apartment so cheap? I won't do it. I won't do it, I tell you. You must be out of your mind. I work 17 hours a day at the office. I'm not going to come home and scrub the floors and be a janitor. We're getting out of here. Do you hear me tonight? We can't leave here. They're bringing the piano tomorrow. Piano? What piano? Well, this is such a beautiful apartment and our furniture is so shabby. So I went out and bought a piano. Paul Blanche. We have five years to pay for it and I only had to give them $100 down. Where'd you get $100? I took it from the sugar bowl you had hidden in the closet. Blanche, that money was for my life insurance. to lapse my policy. No, they won't. I wrote them and told them to deduct it from the money they'll owe us when you drop dead. Don't pay that! Did you say it? I don't care what I say. How could you squander my hard-earned money like that? I deny myself everything. I've been sewing sleeves on your old drawers and wearing them for sweatshirts. I fight with an Indian because I couldn't afford a haircut. I don't even own a pair of pants. I just slap a number on my undershirt and gallop to work as a marathon runner. I never spend a nickel on myself. You came home in a taxi yesterday. That was an ambulance. I threw myself out of the office window just to get a free ride. You can't go out the piano, do you hear me? Now, I'm not going to stay here and be a janitor. Now, wait a minute, John. Don't be hasty. Just listen to reason. I'm deaf. I'll cancel the piano. But I must have this apartment. It's got an extra bedroom. We don't need an extra bedroom. One bedroom is enough, enough for the two of us. John, you don't understand. It isn't always going to be just the two of us. I only found out today that in a few months we're going to have another mouth to feed. Blanche, you, you mean? Yes. My mother's coming to live with us. Good night, Blanche. Good night, John. Today's show was the last of the old gold shows that featured the Bickersons. The new apartment episode was the last one that was on the old gold show. In the fall of 1948, the Bickersons became a segment on the Charlie McCarthy show. We'll talk about that next week with the next Bickersons episode. We are coming up on the end of the Bickersons. I think we have six, maybe eight weeks left of them. Please send your questions and comments to host at classiccomedyotr.com. Come back next Monday for another episode of the Bickersons and check in on Wednesday for the next installment of the Bob Hope Show. Please go to our website classiccomedyotr.com and support our show by clicking on the become a patron button or on the donate button. And please, if you enjoy this podcast, Tell your friends about it. Let them know that it is out there. And that will be a great help as well. Besides, it'll give you something to talk about with them when you can talk about the zany antics of all the people that we listen to. Until next time, in the words of Samuel Johnson, almost all absurdity of conduct arises from the imitation of those who we cannot resemble.